I'm about to do, so please be patient. We're doing a uh, virtual uh, hybrid meeting today, and there are certain things that I need to do. And here it goes. Five, four, three, two, one. Good morning. Good morning. Are we on? I have absolutely no idea why we have to do this at the beginning of every hearing, other than the lawyers say we have to do it. And so, please, um, I call this meeting, this hearing to order, the Readiness Subcommittee of the House Armed Services Committee. First, some administrative and technical notes. Members are reminded that they must be visible on the screen within the software platform for the purposes of identity verification. Members must continue to use the software platform's video function while attending the hearing unless they experience connectivity issues or other technical problems that render the member unable to fully participate on camera. If you experience technical difficulties, please contact the committee staff for assistance. If I experience technical difficulties during this hearing, Mr. Crow has agreed to take over the gavel until I can reconnect. Who wrote that sentence? <laughs> so when your recognized video will be broadcast via the television and internet feeds, you'll be recognized as normal for questions, but if you want to speak at any other time, you must seek recognition verbally. Please do so politely. Please mute your microphone when you're not speaking, and remember to unmute prior to speaking. Please be aware that there will be a slight lag between when you start speaking and when the camera shot switches to you. Please remember to keep the software platform video function on for the entirety of the time you're attending this hearing. If you have to leave for a short period of time, don't. This is an important hearing. However, if you do, please leave your video function on. If you're leaving to join a different proceeding, you can only do one at a time. Be advised that you have designated, that I have designated a committee staff member to mute unrecognized members' microphones if they are acting out, if the dog is climbing or barking, uh, if the cat, other problems are occurring in your home, we will mute you. Please use the platform's chat feature to communicate with staff regarding technical or logistical support issues. Finally, you will see a five minute countdown countdown clock on the software platform, and I have the mute button here if you go beyond five minutes, and I'll certainly remind you. With that, we are here to, oh, now the real part. <laughs> Don't run on my sentences. Thank you for joining us today, gentlemen. Uh, we're here today to discuss the challenges of sustaining the joint force against a near peer competitor. The problem of how to get our forces what they need to meet the wartime demand is not new. History provides countless examples of how the Department of Defense was able to ramp up supply to meet surging wartime demand, but it also shows what happens when those demands fail to be met. These lessons from the past will help us address how we approach some of our current challenges. Namely, how will we ensure that the joint force has the energy the energy resources required to accomplish their current and future mission. Supplying forces with their energy requirements requires both fuel and the capacity to move it across vast distances. This has always been a challenging prospect because it is, because it is resource intensive. It requires both fuel and the transportation needed to move it. But it becomes even more challenging during the instances of near peer conflict. Both the European and Pacific theaters in World War II offer countless examples of how logistics and supply lines impact operations. One is, remind, is to remember General Patton, who when on the offense and short of fuel said, give me 400,000 gallons of gasoline and I'll put you inside Germany in two days. But because he could not be resupplied, the United States lost the initiative and the war dragged on. A German U-boats prioritized sinking oil tankers because they understood it was easier to sink a tanker than a warship, with a similar deterioration result on the war effort. Likewise, commanders in the Pacific were continually concerned about keeping their best warships fueled and ready to engage the enemy. We could talk about Guadalcanal and the removal of the aircraft carriers in that regard. As it has been in the past conflicts, in a future fight, a near-peer adversary 
will certainly try to constrain our ability to provide fuel to the forces. And the Department of Defense uses a lot of fuel. It is, in fact, the largest single consumer of petroleum products in the world. In fiscal year 2017, the Department of Defense consumed over 85 million barrels of fuel to power ships, aircraft, combat, combat vehicles, and contingency bases at a cost of nearly $8.2 billion. Such expansive requirements invite risk, both to the service members on the front line who need the fuel and those who are charged with providing it. Because of this risk and the certainty that an adversary will seek to constrain supply, we must look to the other side of the equation, demand. Reducing the energy demands of our armed forces must be as much a part of our strategy for meeting contested logistics challenges as ensuring that we have fuel and the transport for the supply side of the equation. We must learn the lessons of history and couple them with modern innovation to reduce the demand of our weapons systems. While peacetime demand reduction is often dismissed as unnecessary, environmentally motivated greening of the military, but a reduction of demand is mission critical in a contestant fight because decreasing demand increases joint forces lethality. If we become more fuel efficiency, then we can increase range and maneuverability and decrease cost, which then can, can then be invested elsewhere to increase overall readiness. Today we have the technologies, including electrification, hydrogen fuel cell technologies, and fuel efficiency measures that were unimaginable in the conflicts of the past. But to integrate the right technologies into our strategy, we must overcome the Pentagon's stovepiping that may make this difficult, if not impossible. The military departments must take a holistic approach, research, acquisition, requirement development, and war plan creation. Today's witnesses are our military's logistic leaders, as well as the department's operational energy personnel. They must be engaged and included in this discussion. This collaboration, while often missing in the past, is necessary to lower demand so that the Department of Defense is lethal in a contested environment. While today's witnesses do not have all the answers, they have many, they are uniquely positioned to understand both the operational warfighting requirements the wargaming results, and the challenge of supplying a force in a contested environment. I will remind the members of the subcommittee that as this is an open forum, there may be many times in our discussion when we can only talk in generalities. We will, however, have follow-up meetings, and we will go into detail on these issues. So we will look for those opportunities, and I invite all the members uh, to participate in them. Uh, you will not be able to do so remotely, so plan ahead. We'll give you at least 24 hours notice. With that, Mr. Lamborn, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses for being here today. The future fight will present logistics challenges not experienced in the recent past. Adversaries like Russia and China are seeking to deny access in all domains and to ensure that our supply lines are contested. It is under this all-domain threat that we must be able to rapidly assemble and deploy forces worldwide, and importantly, to support those forces over large distances for lengthy periods of time. That is a tall order. Simply put, we must be planning and solving for the operational energy challenges presented by the future fight. This will require a strategy that considers both supply and demand. A balanced approach will better position our forces for the future. So we have asked the department here today to tell us what is being done to assure energy needs and better plan for scenarios where supply lines are disrupted. We must get this right. When the ability to provide and deliver energy is placed at risk, so too is the department's ability to deploy and sustain forces around the globe. I know that the department and the services take this challenge seriously and have been working hard to find solutions. I look forward to hearing about new systems and concepts and what investments are being planned and made for in innovation tailored to an enhanced ability to operate in contested environments. 
and importantly, how we are assuring that those new concepts are being considered and integrated at program levels. I am a strong supporter of innovative solutions like Project Pele. Safe and reliable mobile or micro reactors present a promising solution to providing abundant energy to our warfighters in remote and austere environments. It is imperative we move quickly to develop new capabilities able to maintain our lines of communication and supply. I know that much of this conversation can get classified quickly, but I am also interested in what we are learning from the planning and execution of war games. It is my hope that these efforts are improving department decision making in concept and capability development and in program investments. And while supply challenges can dominate near-term focus, I am also interested in demand side efforts and opportunities. Efforts to increase the range and capability of the legacy tactical ground vehicle fleet, transform the operational energy performance of manned and unmanned systems, among many others, are vital to long-term solutions. So again, I appreciate the witnesses being here today and I look forward to their comments. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lamborn. A couple of introductions uh, before we uh, introduce our uh, witnesses today. Uh, in the back of the room are two people that are integral in my work. Uh, Rebecca Wolf, who will leave my office in the next uh, week, uh, has been my uh, military fellow from the U.S. Navy. She will have a ship to command, or at least be number two in the command of a ship uh, in the very near future. We thank the Navy for uh, sending her my way. Also, uh, my new hire, my uh, military legislative person, fresh out of the Marine Corps, a uh, former major, now staff, Ellie Ekman. Ellie, in the back of the room. And next to me is Mr. White, my uh, new member of our professional staff. So with those introductions, we'll now move on. Um, and for them, a big thank you. So um, let me do our introductions here. We have uh, from the Joint Staff, Lieutenant General Sam Barrett, uh, Joint Staff Director of Logistics, uh, J-4, Lieutenant General Dwayne Gamble, United States Army Deputy Chief of Staff, G-4, Vice Admiral Rick Williamson, United States Navy Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Fleet Readiness and Logistics, N-4, Lieutenant General Edward Ted Banta, United States Marine Corps Deputy Commandant Installations and Logistics, and Lieutenant General Warren D. Berry, United States Air Force, Deputy Chief of Staff for Logistics, Engineering, and Force Protection, A4. So let's start, General Barrett, if you would. Good morning. Uh, Chairman Garamendi, uh, Ranking Member Lamborn, distinguished members of this committee, thanks for the opportunity to appear today to discuss how operational energy can help address logistics challenges. I'm honored to be here with my Service 4 counterparts who'll provide context from their service perspectives. First and foremost, I want to take a minute to express my pride in the men and women of the U.S. Armed Forces, particularly those in the Joint Logistics Enterprise. Whether conducting the largest airlift evacuation in history supplying and sustaining operations around the world, our logistics professionals are simply the best. But as good as they are, they remain and will remain dependent on the right operational energy architecture to train, move, and sustain military forces across the globe. Operational energy is an important enabler for our warfighting power and one that requires complex integration. In today's contested environment, and in future fights, ensuring the availability of operational energy by reducing consumption, increasing resiliency, and leveraging alternative sources is crucial to our nation's success. As the Joint Force prepares for the full range of military operations, we are continually reviewing operational plans to ensure energy considerations are properly integrated. Through exercises in war games, the Joint Staff evaluates risk to force and risk to mission. For example, the Joint Force Energy War Games Series and our J-4-sponsored 
Advancing Globally Integrated Logistics War Game, which is known as Agile, bring together warfighters from the services, combatant commands, and our allies and partners to explore the potential seams between organizations. These games also evaluate the strengths, weaknesses, and consequences of alternative approaches to operational energy. Without question, our future success depends on robust and accurate assessments of logistics capabilities. These assessments then inform logistics investments. For example, this past year, the department's Logistics Functional Capability Board outlined requirements to deliver petroleum to the joint force over the shore. Similarly, our Joint uh, Logistics Board established a department-wide working group focused on improving the management, visibility, and delivery of bulk fuel in contested environments. These boards and others like them provide operational energy guidance for the fight today while driving reduction in energy requirements for the future. Advances in modern material science, computing, and engineering offer new opportunities to mitigate risk and reduce energy demand. The ability to operate for extended periods over long distances with great speed and payload directly increase our flexibility, our capability, and it reduces the adversary's opportunity to disrupt operations. Alternative energy sources like electricity, low carbon fuels, nuclear power, provide opportunities to reduce petroleum footprints while increasing military capability. Reducing demand for energy is a critical component of our military's ability to sustain distributed operations against our potential adversaries. As a nation, we have faced operational energy challenges before, especially in World War II. Most recently, our adversaries watched us build iron mountains of supplies to achieve our nation's goals. In response, adversaries have developed capabilities to counter our global logistics advantage. As our competitors vie for increased influence, they will actively exploit seams in our logistics and our operational energy networks. We know that modernizing the joint force operational energy construct and capabilities will play a critical role in overcoming those shared challenges. Finally, we will continue to prioritize our most vital asset, our people. Our logistics professionals are the linchpin to America's ability to pursue global objectives. Developing and training these logistics professionals is absolutely essential. Thanks again for the opportunity to speak today. I look forward to the statements of my peers and friends, and I look forward to your questions. General Barrett, thank you very much. You set the stage. General Gambo, Gamble, please. Chairman Garamendi, Ranking Member Lamborn, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, on behalf of Secretary Warmouth, General McConville, and the soldiers' families and civilians of the United States Army, thanks for the opportunity today to discuss operational energy's contributions to both logistics capabilities and to Army readiness. We in the Army define operational energy as the energy associated systems, information, and processes required to train, move, and sustain forces and systems in support of military operations. Energy is the key enabler that drives operational capabilities and the primary objective of our operational energy plan is to improve warfighter capacity, capability, and to win the nation's wars. The contested operating environments described by both uh, you, Mr. Chairman, and you, uh, Ranking Member Lamborn, uh, in these are the environments we, which we expect to fight and in which the U.S. could be engaged, and it's, that's all the more necessary to make operational energy capabilities uh, important and decisive to our success. Potential adversaries continue to improve their ability to contest the lines of communication, deny us access, and target our forces. One way our Army is seeking to mitigate the risks within these, with these, within these contested environments is to reduce the demand for supplies and services, including fuel, which will extend range, operational endurance, maintain battlefield momentum, and increase freedom of action, all the while minimizing soldier exposure to enemy action. 
We are also looking at ways to field new and emerging operational energy capabilities that will give us an edge on the battlefield. To accomplish these goals, we are developing the Army's first operational energy strategy. It's currently on track to be signed in spring of 2022. The Army operational energy strategy identifies challenges in the future operating environment. It presents and it, uh, those challenges and is focused on two desired goals. The first goal is to increase warfighter capability by increasing operational endurance, duration, and reach. To accomplish this, we believe we must enable maneuver units to operate autonomously from their lines of communication by decreasing sustainment requirements at the point of need. This has an added benefit of decreasing logistics, signatures, and footprints of soldiers, equipment, and infrastructure. The second goal of our operational energy strategy is to increase energy security and increase energy resilience so that we can accomplish our mission despite disruptions from the enemy, from the weather, and the terrain. This will be accomplished through capability development of systems at scale that can be utilized multiple sources of energy, including alternative energies, and have the capability to store, manage, and control re required energy and to, and to distribute that energy to soldiers, systems, ground and aerial platforms, as well as to mission command nodes tied to microgrids. In addition to our operational energy strategy, our Army is finalizing our Army climate strategy, which will provide a roadmap for the Army to mitigate and adapt to climate change. I personally participated in incorporating logistics and energy resilience into that climate strategy, so I know firsthand how well logistics capabilities are embedded in our efforts to combat climate change. In closing, I would like to emphasize that the Army absolutely recognizes the tie between operational energy and our logistics capabilities required in a contested environment. As part of our responsibility to provide foundational logistics capabilities to the Joint Force, the Army is working diligently to make sure our strategies produce tangible, actionable improvements in the operational energy and to yield decisive capabilities in contested environments worldwide. Thank you once more for the, the opportunity to present this testimony and for your continued support of the soldiers, civilians, and families of the United States Army. Thank you very much, General. We now turn to Admiral Williamson. Uh, Chairman Garamenti, Ranking Member uh, Lambert, and distinguished members of the House Armed Service Committee on Readiness, thank you for the opportunity to provide this subcommittee a Navy perspective on how Navy's operational energy efforts are addressing logistic challenges. The Naval Logistics Enterprise reached its peak in World War II and sustained that stance through the Cold War. In subsequent decades, our logistics posture changed to peacetime efficiency. The Logistics Enterprise has performed well over the years sustaining our warfighters. For the first time in over three decades, both the 2018 National Defense and the Tri-Service Maritime Strategies clearly and firmly orient the national security environment towards strategic competition. This environment comprises long-term global competition across multiple domains, spans the global industrial base and operational battle space, and requires technological, operational, and strategic solutions within uh, significant unpredictably, unpredictable and uncertainty. However, these achievements took place in the context of a permissive maritime environment against non-peer adversaries. A cost-efficient hub-and-spoke model works well. Just-in-time delivery is sufficient for a fleet that is not widely dispersed or, or dynamically maneuvering under persistent multi-domain attack. Hub-and-spoke is effective in peacetime operations, but once we shift to phase two operations, it's not sustainable. In 2019, the Secretary of the Navy set operational energy priorities for the department to address gaps in alignment of energy supply and demand in strategic competition. Those in include extending operational re reach of current and future weapon systems through more effective use of energy, reducing energy consumption and external energy logistics requirements to four deployed strike groups and increasing the effective use, conversion, storage, and distribution of operational energy. The CNO follows SECNAV's operational energy goals with Navy-specific objectives that target energy and acquisition, optimizing energy use, energy supply chain, and supply and demand management. The Navy is answering those goals and objectives. We're increasing operational energy modeling capabilities to appropriately assess energy supportability and acquisition. 
incorporating efficiency measures in ships and aircraft, increased investment in batteries and electrification of warfighting systems, and integrating energy command and control tools into the Navy's log IT systems. The Navy is actively shifting the logistics paradigm from a pull to a push system, moving away from the just-in-time logistics of hub-and-spoke design to a concept with distributed nodes. The Navy uses the five-vector model of maritime sustainment, refuel, revive, rearm, repair, and resupply. Aligning to these vectors, our, national, our naval logistics enterprise will develop new, divest of legacy, and improve existing capabilities to include those that deliver operational energy to the warfighter. We will continue to apply analytic rigor to our logistics problems, including condition-based maintenance, supply chain, and industrial base, to enable expeditionary operations per distributed maritime operations and expeditionary advanced base op operations. We will continue to work to provide the operational energy and logistics capabilities our naval forces need. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, sir. Admiral, thank you very much. We now turn to uh, General Banta, United States Marine Corps. Good morning. Chairman Garamendi, Ranking Member Lamborn, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to discuss how the Marine Corps' approach to operational energy can help address logistics challenges, especially in contested environments. To meet the Commandant's vision for Force Design 2030, the Marine Corps has spent the last two years making significant changes to how it is organized, trained, equipped, and postured to meet the demands of the future operating environment. The Joint Force requires a capability that operates persistently and with maximum organic mobility and dispersion to compete and deter in the contact and blunt layers. As a result, the Marine Corps has taken steps to modernize, including deliberate efforts to invest, divest, and reset. Logistics is the Marine Corps' current pacing function in this effort. As we pivot from two decades of extensive land operations to a focus on executing expeditionary advanced base operations, the Marine Corps is developing its approach to sustaining stand-in forces in a contested and dynamic environment. Advancements in operational energy technologies present an opportunity for the Marine Corps to increase lethality, extend operational reach, and self-sustain units while simultaneously providing positive contributions towards climate imperatives. Our approach to operational energy includes reducing demand, investing in more fuel-efficient systems, and exploring alternative energy sources. We've partnered with academia, the Navy, and our Joint Force counterparts to examine our operational energy architecture in the expeditionary environment. The results have informed the Marine Corps' focus on developing and adopting viable solutions to address our logistics challenges. The Marine Corps' 2030 Strategic Logistics Plan outlines our approach to meeting future logistics challenges across four lines of effort, enabling global logistics awareness, diversifying distribution, improving sustainment, and operationalizing installations to support sustained operations. Within these lines of effort, the Marine Corps requires critical capabilities to ensure our forces can operate in this environment. We support the Navy's effort to develop light combatant surface vessels and ancillary logistics connectors, such as the Light Amphibious Warship, or LAW, to support littoral sustainment and maneuver. Leasing commercial vessels can also provide flexibility and redundancy and allows us to experiment with our sustainment concepts in the near term. A modernized prepositioning network with the right mix of afloat and ashore capabilities, as well as uncrewed logistics systems, will reduce risk in future sustainment missions. The challenges we face in the future operating environment will blur the distinction between operations at home and overseas. Many of the same threats faced by our installations at home will also be faced by our advanced naval bases, all of which are critical to the Marine Corps' support to naval and joint operations. Resiliency efforts require hardened critical and energy infrastructure to support the force before, during, and after deployment. Increasing our installation's capability and capacity underpins our forward presence. The Marine Corps is committed to a future force unleashed from the tether of fossil fuels on the battlefield. The service actively continues to invest in developing expeditionary and alternative operational energy sources and systems to achieve energy resilience and enable the persistence and mobility that a naval expeditionary force demands. Increased lethality, range, and endurance of Marine Corps formations remain warfighting imperatives that drive our force modernization efforts. 
Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today and for your oversight, import, input, and support as we develop the capabilities to sustain our stand-in forces. I look forward to working with you to further our warfighting capability and the readiness of our power projection platforms. Thank you. I thank you very much, General. We now turn to the United States Air Force. General Barry. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Garamendi, Ranking Member Lamborn, and the distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you as well for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss operational energy and its nexus to logistics opportunities and challenges in a contested environment. Air power is critical to the success of modern military operations in the joint force, and our basing and logistics enterprise is the foundation that generates Air Force combat power, from air superiority to long-range strike. Our pacing adversaries have watched our operations over the last two decades and have developed ways to attempt to blunt or take away America's air power advantage. In the event of conflict, we expect our air bases and logistics supply chains will be subject to determined multi-domain attack. Our adversaries' kinetic air and missile capabilities drive us to be prepared to rapidly disperse and maneuver our air forces, commonly referred to as Agile Combat Employment, or ACE. In the face of kinetic threats, ACE allows us to generate combat power from potentially vulnerable forward bases. Of course, we also know that such maneuver greatly complicates the logistical challenges, particularly in the realm of operational energy. And while we are still experimenting with concepts that allow us to deliver and sustain persistent logistics and persistent mission generation while under attack, we also know that this is inherently a solvable problem. Operational energy remains a key ingredient to achieving that persistent mission generation. Operational energy is a critical enabler to our global mission, as aviation fuel and energy to power aircraft comprised over 82% of the $4.6 billion Air Force energy bill in 2020. While the Air Force relies on the Joint Force and the Defense Logistics Agency to sustain our energy and fuel supply lines, we are constantly seeking solutions to improve operational energy efficiency, especially given these logistical challenges. We're committed to improving fuel efficiency and reducing costs through leveraging alternative energy sources when it provides a competitive advantage and where practical. We focused our efforts to reduce operational energy demand in three broad areas. Reducing the footprint required for mission generation forward, reducing aviation and ground fuels demand, and reducing installation energy demands from our bases forward and at home. In that vein, I'd like to highlight just two of the many promising initiatives the Air Force is pursuing. The first is actually an example of a bottom-up innovation from an outstanding senior non-commissioned officer in the Air Force. It's called the Viper Kit. And the Viper Kit takes existing petroleum, oil, and lubricant, or POL, uh, components from an R11 refueling truck and configures them into a small custom sled that eliminates the need for those R11 refueling trucks during hot refuel operations in a forward deployed environment. It has an immediate impact on our energy footprint it decreases our deployment processing times by 96% and distribution costs by 90% and obviously is much easier to take into combat. Second, the Air Force Civil Engineering Center is developing a new system for expeditionary base power called the Base Power Load and Installation Management System. And it allows for the seamless integration of alternative and renewable energy sources from any type of energy source. This type of innovative work is ongoing throughout the force and in concert with the joint working groups that ensure standard interfaces and help avoid duplicative effort. Ultimately, our focus must be squarely on preparing to fight through determined multi-domain attacks against our basing and logistics forces while generating decisive air power effects on the adversary now and in the future. Operational energy is critical to doing so. We have some of the answers today, and through our continued experimentation, tough training, and an innovative culture of empowered airmen, we will further enhance our capabilities to achieve and retain relative advantage in the future. Thanks again to the members of the subcommittee for your support of the Air Force and my DOD partners here with me today, and I look forward to our discussion on this very important topic. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your testimony. I would uh, bring to the attention of the committee the written testimony, which was uh, without objection be made part of the uh, record of this hearing. And I want to thank uh, you and your staff for an exceptionally uh, good written testimony that covers many of these issues and focus clearly on the issue at hand, operational energy, and how we might reduce those, um, the, the, the need for it. Um, 
The uh, witnesses received a copy of this a few moments ago. I hand this to the uh, members that are here. For those of you that are uh, out there in uh, virtual land, I'm going to hold this up. This is an 1869 chart of Napoleon's march to Moscow from uh, eastern Germany, or what was then, what is now Lithuania. And if you look at it, you'll notice that he started off with an enormous uh, number of troops and supplies. And uh, the uh, brown line here is what he wound up with in Moscow. And the black line is what he wound up in his return. Uh, he didn't use petroleum products as energy, but he used horses and horses need to be fed. And the Russians figured out that if there was nothing for the horses to eat, they might get hungry. And eventually, uh, Napoleon wound up using the horses as food, not supply. Also, uh, this chart demonstrates another issue, which is not the subject of this committee, but will be at some point, And that is the health of the troops. Uh, most of the troops died as a result of typhus. That was. Uh, spread throughout the force by uh, lice. And along the way, uh, this is a demonstration of one of the world's great generals and what he failed to deal with. Um, and yes, I would like to put that in the record also. Um, and for the edification of all of us that we need to pay attention. Even the world's great generals missed a couple of things along the way. He thought he could supply his troops on the way to Moscow. The Russians had a different idea. They burned the fields, burned the houses, and the troops were hungry. So I bring this to our attention to drive home the point that this is exceedingly, exceedingly important, that we pay attention, in this case, to the energy. The other, the other logistical issues will be, uh, have been and will continue to be subject matter of this committee in future hearings. So. I could ask a lot of questions. I really uh, want to turn uh, very quickly to my colleagues on the uh, committee, both Democrats and Republicans. We'll have the uh, gavel order in a few moments. But my fundamental question to the five of you is, you understand this issue. Your uh, written testimony, as well as your oral testimony today, speaks to your clear understanding and the priority that uh, in this case, operational energy presents to you, uh, to your operations, and, and frankly, to the task that you're responsible for. My question is different. What do you need from us to be successful in reducing your energy requirements uh, and in achieving a distribution, a, a of appropriate uh, availability of that energy where it is needed. And so the question is really back to us, or the issue is back to us. We're, we need to know <clears throat> by the end of this hearing and by the, uh, the work that will be following on it, and that will involve a uh, classified briefings, what do we need to do? Uh, we may or may not be able to do anything in this year's NDAA. The rumors are that there might actually be a conclusion to it. That was a happy thought, um, and let's hold that for a while. Uh, but in the next NDAA, I want this committee to address this issue squarely. And in order for us to do that, we need you to tell us what you need. We'll, of course, review it, and we'll make sure that it's, uh, at least in our view, sensible. and. Um, appropriate. So I'm going to let my question go uh, there unanswered, but during the course of the hearing, if uh, the opportunity presents itself in the questions put forth by my colleagues, uh, please come back and challenge us along the way. Mr. Lamborn, I turn to you. Thank you, and thank you for having this hearing. Uh, thank you again to you gentlemen for being here today. As I mentioned in my opening statement, I'm a supporter of innovative solutions to the operational energy challenge like Project Pele. Mobile microreactors have the potential to be employed in austere and remote areas. Who has any thoughts on this capability? Uh, could microreactors be part of the solution?
Thank you, Member Lamborn. Uh, Dwayne Gamble, U.S. Army. I'll jump on that. Uh, the Army clearly sees a utility for uh, that type of technology. We're, uh, we, uh, we've received briefings from the Strategic Capabilities Office. Uh, our Army Corps of Engineers and the Army G4, my teams, have, have spoken with the Strategic Capabilities Office, who's currently developing that, um, that, cap that technology. Uh, it's my understanding the technology is not quite mature yet, but we expect it, of course, to become mature in the future. Um, and we even had an Army Requirements Oversight Council meeting on it this last year. So it, it has it's also received the attention of Army senior leaders. Uh, really, that's all I have to report on at this point, but there's clearly opportunity there once the technology comes to fruition. Okay, does the Navy or anyone else have a comment on micro-reactors? Uh, Ranking Member Lamborn, General Bantam, Marine Corps. So uh, while not intimately familiar with the concept of micro-reactors, the Marine Corps clearly uh, appreciates the value and potential future uh, benefits of alternative ener energy sources. Through our Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, uh, we have been involved in looking at hydrogen fuel as a potential future source. And I would think that combining that with both microgrids as well as potentially microreactors would provide great benefit to us in the future, particularly operating in an expeditionary environment. So, so we'll remain engaged with, uh, through our joint staff partners as well as uh, services and Congress on those efforts. Thank you. Okay. Congressman Lemore, I would just say, as uh, you may have read in the press, the, uh, the Air Force announced a uh, microreactor project, pilot project that we are going to put into uh, Alaska. Uh, we, we expect that to be in the FY 27, 2027 uh, realm, that we would do it as a power purchasing agreement uh, where we would basically buy that power. But it's a way to get us some redundancy and uh, resiliency in the power demand uh, at that installation, and we look forward to what that pilot project might tell us. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, echo uh, a lot of what uh, my fellow members uh, spoke to. Anything that uh, allows us the freedom of maneuver, we're obviously very interested in. Um, being able to uh, divorce the operational uh, fleet uh, from the logistics tether uh, gives us maneuverability. Maneuverability equals survivability. Uh, we, as you know, we have very big reactors. Um, but uh, we have to look at the problem of sustaining the fleet as a whole. And so that is going to be done uh, both ashore and afloat. So if there is potential there, obviously it provides a tremendous operational advantage for us. Okay. And finally, I would just say, I don't think we can afford to not explore it within the realm of uh, demand reduction. And uh, it's been well stated by my colleagues, uh, the ongoing efforts, but there's certainly a place for this to take a look at, at both our, our resiliency, energy independence, uh, and uh, certainly in an expeditionary a location that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you all. And my next question I'd like to ask you about is the electrification of vehicles. Now, I know for the Navy uh, vessels or, or for the Air Force for uh, uh, airborne um, planes, you know, we're probably a ways off. But for the Army, uh, the electrification of ground vehicles is something that's a present day option. And I know in your written statement, uh, General Gamble, you did talk about the progress being made in the advantages of electric vehicles. I know that there are also disadvantages. You have to have a reliable electric source. And um, in theater, that may or may not be available. And uh, also, there are some people who say that uh, you're just transferring the energy problem from a, your neighborhood gas station to a remote uh, electric plant out in the desert. Uh, but it's the same um, demand e in either case when you look at the big picture. But uh, you did have some interesting things that you said in your written testimony. So could you elaborate uh, in this open setting, of course, nothing classified, but what uh, advantages and disadvantages you see for more use of electric vehicles on the ground? Representative Lamborn, thanks for your question. Uh, indeed, I believe the Army believes we're at an inflection point on the electrification of the tactical wheeled vehicle uh, fleet as well as the combat vehicle fleet. Uh, and while, and, and it, because of, it's because of commercial industry and the technologies that have emerged, as well as to 
the Department of Defense and some work done there as well. But really, it's it's about uh, the inflection point really stems from our commercial industry and available technology. We believe the technology is scalable as well to our at least our tactical wheel vehicle fleet. Uh, we see that the the challenges you described, um, you know, full electrification for our complex weapon systems at the forward edge of the battlefield is a goal that we don't believe that currently our technology will support that. Having said that, in FY22, uh, we'll continue to prototype one of our Bradley fighting vehicles to be full, fully electric. Uh, for our JLTV, Joint Light Tactical Vehicles, and our you know, Humvee fleet, our high mobility, multi-purpose wheel vehicles in FY22, we'll test hybrid electric Humvees and JLTVs as well. Uh, so as w while we're doing testing and prototyping of, of hybrid electric, full electric remains our, our stretch goal. Our strategy, and I believe I touched on it in my written testimony, is really kind of a three-part strategy. It's hybrid electric, uh, anti-idle, hybrid electric, and full electric, and it, and it meets what we think the, this, the goal on full electric is in the 2030, 2035 timeframe for complex weapon systems. Uh, because we believe that at the end of the technology will be matured. Um, we do think, though, in the short term, anti-idle technology, we're incorporating that in some of our, our vehicles today uh, and working, working to do that. We believe that, re that reduces thermal signature. It increases operational range and endurance. It reduces you know, fuel consumption as well. So this demand uh, reduction that both you and the chairman talked about, it's dead in our sights. So I hope I answered your question, sir. Yeah, thank you so much. Does anyone have anything to add, or does that pretty much cover where we're at right now? Sir, sorry, I just say from an Air Force perspective, right, um, a, a large part of our support equipment that we use to generate air power, uh, diesel. Uh, and so we, we echo what, uh, what General Gamble said, right? There, there is a great capability as we look at leveraging what commercial industry is doing with electrification to, to use perhaps photovoltaic cells to provide uh, lighting on the airfields as we do aircraft operations or munitions loading operations to electrify loaders, right, that, that put munitions on aircraft so that we, we do have some resiliency and redundancy and we aren't just uh, beholden uh, to the POL farm that's there, but we have other means and other sources of generating combat capability without relying on diesel. Okay, thank you all so much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lamborn. The, um Gavel order that we presently have would be Mr. Calais, followed by Mr. Wilson. Uh, and I think on the remote side of this, uh, Ms. Slotkin has joined us and perhaps, uh, here we go. So heads up team, here we are. Calahi, Wilson, Strickland, Bergman. You're on this twice, Wilson. What's going on here? And Slotkin. Pardon? Got a very busy schedule. Okay. Mr. Clay, you're up. Mahalo, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Vice Admiral Williamson, my comments and questions this morning are related to the Red Hill bulk storage facility and the Navy's entire pipeline infrastructure and fuel operations on the island of Oahu in my home state of Hawaii. Many of my colleagues, Mr. Chairman, right now might not know about Red Hill, so I want to take just a few minutes to share some background on this facility. The Red Hill fuel storage facility contains 20 steel tanks encased by up to four feet of concrete and surrounded by basalt bedrock. Construction on the Red Hill bulk fuel storage facility began in secret a year before the attack on Pearl Harbor and was constructed underground to provide maximum protection of the fuel supply. The facility remained classified until 1995. This is the largest single Department of Defense fuel storage facility in the Pacific Theater and it has the capability to accommodate 250 million gallons of fuel and currently contains approximately 110 million gallons of fuel. There is no question that Red Hill is a strategic and operationally important asset for the U.S. military in Indo-Pacific. However, it is equally or more important for this committee to know that the Red Hill facility, located approximately 100 feet above one of the island's main groundwater aquifers, is safe. The aquifers are sources of portable water and are vulnerable to contamination from an unscheduled discharge of fuel from the facility. Dating back to 1947, there have been dozens of fuel leaks. The worst leak in recent years was in January of 2014, 
when the U.S. Navy discovered a fuel leak of approximately 27,000 gallons of fuel. I'm bringing up Red Hill today because the Navy is currently experiencing a crisis of astronomical proportions in Hawaii. The Navy's water system is contaminated with petroleum. Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam's water systems are entirely shut down. Almost 100,000 people are without water. Our military families, people are getting sick, animals are getting sick, and our military families need answers, and the island of Oahu needs answers. Earlier this week, I personally visited, Mr. Chairman, some of the impacted Navy personnel and their families. One mother I met, Amanda, invited me into her home to test the water from her kitchen, water that she and her family had been consuming for a week after the most recent leak on November 20th as a result of operator error. At her invitation, I collected water samples from her kitchen. This water right here. Amanda had her daughter at home in Zoom classes because her school was closed due to the contamination. Her family had been drinking the water for days. Her dog got sick, was vomiting. Her daughter went to the ER. Her son experienced an unusual sore on his mouth. Today, Amanda just texted me, and it's about 6 o'clock in the morning, Hawaii time, Mr. Chairman, that she went to the Tripler emergency room last night because of a headache and irritation in her mouth and throat, and her doctor diagnosed her with chemical burns in her mouth. She is worried, rightfully so, about her health and the health of her family. Another military mother, Kelly, emailed me at 9 o'clock last night. She's six months pregnant. She had been drinking the water for a week, and she is rightfully so in a panicked state. As you can see here, there is a sheen on this drinking water. This is taken out of somebody's kitchen, Navy family housing at Pearl Harbor. And I can tell you myself that if you smell this water, you would know that there is something wrong with this water. There's a petroleum product in this water. Right now, the Navy is relying on community donations and using water tankers to distribute clean water to residents. You can smell some type of petroleum chemical in the water. The Department of Health and the University of Hawaii has con confirmed the petroleum in the water. And there have been concerns on the community for years on the possibility of leaks from Red Hill into the drinking water supply. This is a mother walking up to a water distribution site with a five-gallon jug so that she can take a shower last night. And yet the Navy seems totally unprepared for this situation that has now impacted the military's own service members and families. And what is happening on the ground in Hawaii right now is absolutely unacceptable. And I understand the operational importance of Red Hill facility to our military today and our military's readiness in the future. However, there have been three reported fuel leaks on Oahu in the last 20 months, and we need answers. So I have two questions for you. Although the Navy has said there are no indications that the tanks are leaking, many Hawaii residents are calling for the immediate drainage of all the Red Hill fuel tanks. As I stated in my opening remarks, there are over a dozen tanks that contain more than 110 million gallons of fuel. So first question, is it possible to make Red Hill safe for our water supply and our community? If yes, how? What are the steps that need to be taken immediately and how quickly can they be taken? We know the status quo is not working. My second question is logistically, how would draining the facility work if we called for the shutdown of the Red Hill bulk fuel storage facility? How long would it take? Where would you store the fuel? And at what draining the Red Hill fuel tanks would mean for the United States military? And I know I've run out of time, so I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Mr. Kalehi, you have whatever time is necessary. Well, we think we know where this question is going to go. Admiral Williamson. Yes, sir. Uh, first, sir, I want to uh, say that this has obviously my leadership's full attention, and we're taking it very seriously. Um, the health and safety of our uh, sailors, their families, the surrounding community is of the utmost importance. Um, you know, we share your concerns. We are committed uh, to uh, find the facts, get the root causes, and make the appropriate uh, uh, corrections to anything that we discover. You have our commitment to be completely transparent with the local government, the local people, our sailors, our families, and with this committee. Um, as far as your questions go, sir, I'd love to take that for the record and come back to you uh, with an answer. It is a question that the people of Hawaii are asking for of this congressional delegation. Uh, and, and we don't know how that would be possible to drain 110 million gallons of fuel. Where would you put it? How would you do it? How long would it take? 
But these are questions that the people of Hawaii are asking, and, and it's questions that we need to provide to the governor and state legislators and elected officials and, and the community in Hawaii. So. My understanding is that we should be, based on a conversation that the delegation had with the Secretary of the Navy, who is on his way or will be on his way to Hawaii um, to be boots on the ground and, and um, taking charge of this situation directly, that we will be receiving um, one of the water samples that was sent to a mainland distribution or a mainland testing facility by this afternoon. If those tests come back with some type of petroleum substance chemical in the water, um, affirming what the University of Hawaii and the State Department of Health released yesterday and that their preliminary um, samples have some type of petroleum in the water. And, and I can guarantee you, uh, Vice Admiral Williamson, if you smell this water that I allowed the chairman to smell before this hearing started, you would know that something's wrong with this water. But if the Navy's test comes back this afternoon with a petroleum product in the water, what is the Navy going to do? Well, I hope the Navy is taking the next five to six hours to prepare for that if those tests come back. Um, and and I, I can't emphasize it enough. You know, this is a crisis uh, that we have not seen in Hawaii. Um, you know, Hawaii has a strong military community, um, but this is something that is affecting the lives of our service members, their families, the public, the community. Red Hill provides about 25%, or the halava shaft and the aquifer underneath the Red Hill fuel tanks, halava, Wayava, and Red Hill provide about 25% of the entire groundwater aquifer source for the island of Oahu, which has about a million residents. It is, um, we, we cannot have this water source contaminated by petroleum fuel from the Red Hill tanks, and it's something that um, we really re need to take seriously. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Clay, uh, thank you for bringing this to the attention of the committee. Uh, this issue is this committee's issue. It's one of the infrastructure pieces that we're responsible uh, for, and we will be following up. Uh, Admiral Williamson, if you would uh, respond by early afternoon to the questions that uh, Mr. Clay, he has put forth. Uh, there appears to be a serious ongoing public health issue, uh, and the probability is that the uh, U.S. military, Navy, Red Hill facility is responsible. Uh, so if you'll uh, have your people get back to this committee, and we'll disseminate the information to all the committee members, and certainly Mr. Clay, uh, you'll be the first to uh, hear whatever information there is available. Uh, the issue also, um, and that's your follow-up question, uh, which is uh, directly to the point of this hearing. Uh, we're talking about operational energy issues. Uh, these um, storage facilities are specifically for operational energy, both uh, on the base or bases in the Pacific, as well as the uh, um, equipment that would be using the uh, uh, petroleum products. So your second question is goes to the heart of our concerns specifically today, and that is how can we reduce the need for operational energy uh, and thereby reduce the potential problems such as you have brought to this committee as well as the uh, operational problems that would occur. So we'll continue on that. Uh, I think the point of this hearing will bring more clarity uh, to your second point. And as we go through the second round of questions, you may want to come back if you've not had, have not been satisfied. Um, a modification in the uh, order here, Mr. Wilson, I understand you are going to stand aside and Mr. Scott is going to take the next question. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank Mr. Wilson. I have a, a 12 o'clock uh, as well that's 
also important. Uh, gentlemen, uh, General Warren, you mentioned diesel, and uh, diesel is not refined to the same standard in every country. And my question for you is virtually every operation that we have requires diesel, whether it be for a generator or whether it be for an engine. Uh, how are you taking into account the different standards of refining of diesel throughout the various uh, areas of operation? Thanks, Congressman Scott. One of the things that we do uh, as we scan the horizon of the locations that we would be most likely using for uh, contingency operations, we send teams out to do site surveys. Uh, and they look at everything from um, uh, operational locations in terms of, you know, ramp space, in terms of facilities, but, but we also look at fuel. Uh, and we will go out and test pavements for uh, the, the strength of the pavement to handle the, the aircraft that we'll bring in, and we also look at fuel, and we test fuel. Uh, so everywhere we go, we are looking at what those standards are. Uh, and do they match what we require to run our equipment? And if they don't, uh, then we will go back and get an engineering analysis to see if there's a way that we could still use the diesel that's there. Mm. Uh, and if not, then we make plans and contingencies to do something different. But we do take that into consideration in our operational planning. So, so to be clear, the newer tier of diesel engines in the United States sim simply can't function on uh, the diesel that's refined in certain parts of Africa and other parts of the world. And I just want to make sure that as we push forward, uh, that we that we take that into account with with I, I know we're concerned about emissions and other things and we should be we can and should do a better job of taking care of the environment but ultimately when we're in a fight we have to win that fight and uh, I'm I'm concerned I, I can tell you and I'm I'm you know this is happening with farmers right now I mean the majority of the shutdowns on the on the tractors are coming from deaf fluid problems and uh, sensor problems and other things, and I just I want to make sure we're being very very careful in your operations that uh, that we don't uh, end up with engines that aren't able to function in, in, in areas where the fuel is readily available. Uh, so, uh, with one last question, General Barrett, in your testimony, you state that the days of uh, hand waving is your terminology, logistics risk and limitations and a war gaming exercise are over and our future success in contested environment depends on robust logistics capabilities. What are the most important insights and lessons learned from the energy, the joint force energy war games and what concerns you the most? First of all, uh, Congressman Scott, thanks for that question. Yeah, very much appreciated and a good question. Uh, let me let me uh, start by saying that uh, I, I do believe we've had a very strong focus on uh, fuel distribution uh, in in the war games that we've executed over the last year. I, I think a, a significant increase in, in uh, visibility to look at that. And you're right; there there are no easy solutions. That's that's one thing that we've taken away. But let let me uh, let me just summarize three hard hitting. Um, strategic observations that we've pulled from, from the war games and exercises that we've seen first and foremost. We have to get better with uh, decisively being able to see ourselves globally. Uh, I, I would tell you that any operational energy problem that we face today, tomorrow, in the future is a global problem. It's a global uh, it's a global ecosystem that we have to look at. So we have to be able to see ourselves uh, going forward. One of the action items that we're taking out of recent uh, war games and exercises to advance that proposition is we have, we have tasked the development of an end-to-end -end energy uh, oper operating picture, common operating picture was called a COP. We're going to take a first look at that in December, and uh, we're encouraged uh, it, it's something that we're going to have to do across many, many things, fuel and munitions. But that is, that is uh, strategic observation and lesson learned, number one, and one action point to get after it. Number two, uh, for, from, our, from our war games and exercises, it, it, it is apparent that we have a persistent shortage of intratheater distribution assets. 
So if, if we look at the Pacific Theater, and I would dare say it's not limited to the Pacific, but that is a significant focus. Um, we, we are getting after that problem set. Uh, I can talk more about how we're doing it, uh, given more time later on, but I will tell you that we define that problem set um, in terms of the last tactical thousand miles because the theater is so big. But we have got to look at solution sets for intra-theater distribution uh, going forward. One tangible example that we're getting after is our, you are likely familiar with the vice chairman's emphasis on the joint requirements and oversight uh, co uh, committee. And uh, we have worked very hard within that to, uh, to charter uh, a look at multiple capable distribution platforms. So we can take all of the services and, and what they bring to the fight and look across that and find joint solutions so that we can close that gap. And then finally, uh, I, would, uh, I would tell you that uh, it is obvious from our war games that the importance of allies and partners and industry, uh, it jumps off the page at us on what we uh, would need to do forward. So we've conducted numerous engagements with our allies and partners. They possess unique capabilities to help us uh, diversify our energy needs in the Pacific Theater and other places around the globe. Thank you for the question. Thank you, gentlemen. Gentlemen, thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Scott. You've raised an important issue here. We're going to follow up on the diesel issue that you raised and the quality of the fuel. And we'll want to write that into uh, some of our report here and, and get feedback. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping here. Uh, Mr. Kalehi presented uh, phot photography and also some information. I'm not sure that we can take your water and put it into the record, but all of the rest of it will be put into the record without uh, unanimous consent. We'll do that. Very good. Uh, we now have uh, Mr. Bergman. You're up. Okay, we always do a comm check. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and ranking member. Thank you to the panel. Um, number one, I was very uh, excited to hear um, you just explain how, how the uh, war gaming and the joint, uh, joint environment is to establish where the vulnerabilities are with our, uh, whether it's uh, electric, whether it's diesel, whether it's hydrogen, no matter what uh, the capability that we're going to bring to the fight, and it's going to enable you to win in the fight. And it was good to hear of all the joint uh, exercises that you're doing. Uh, I would suggest to you it would be helpful for us as members of, especially of this committee, to understand more of that. So if there is a way to do, for lack of a better term, whether it's a simple tabletop exercise, you know, with with uh, flat screens and you know, in a operation center, however you want to do it, that would be helpful for this uh, committee to understand some of the things that you're going through. Because I'm going to make an assumption that all of you sitting at the table are war fighters. That's why you wear the uniform. And there's only one outcome in a war fight, and that's to win. And you win by number one, never quitting, but number two, by preparing in advance. So in the, in the Sun Tzu fashion, if you do it right, you don't have to fight because the adversary decides that you're gonna, you will destroy them in the fight. So I applaud all of you for that. Um, there is no one size fits all uh, solution to what we're talking about. And the, the ability to innovate is going to come from industry not from the United States military, not from the Department of Defense. Will you have a hand in it? Yes, by evaluating and making suggestions for requirements that allow contracts to be let, that allow uh, new capabilities to be introduced into the system at a rate so that we are ahead. I really don't have any questions other than, and I'm going to close with one comment because time is valuable. Anytime you can yield it back, is that I would suggest to you that as warfighters and all of you are commanders uh, coming up through your 05 ranks and 06 and, and above, but I would suggest to you 
the biggest climate issue that you could be working on within your services is your command climate. And with that, I yield back. Uh, Mr. Bergman, we th thank you for your comments and for your experience. And uh, this committee will lean on all of the members as we drive the policy or assist in achieving the goal here of reducing uh, the energy consumption uh, and the resiliency of the military in that regard. So uh, thank you. And uh, you, made an, you made a very good statement, but I want to get deeper into your own personal knowledge. So we'll come at you. Uh, Mr. Wilson, you're next. I don't know where my Democratic colleagues are, but uh, we'll run through the Republicans here. You're here. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And uh, in the uh, tradition of uh, Congressman Lambert being so visionary, I appreciate that he uh, raised the issue uh, of the micro reactors. Uh, and I'm very grateful to um, represent the Savannah River site uh, laboratory uh, in South Carolina and the uh, micro reactors, small module reactors, SMRs. Uh, what a potential we have, and particularly, uh, Admiral, with uh, the potential, say, at a, uh, on a base which is an island, i.e., Paris Island or uh, Guam. And I think of how helpful it would be to uh, have small module reactors. And then, um, Admiral, too, with the experience of um, nuclear submarines, nuclear aircraft carriers, gosh, we should um, be uh, on the cusp of uh, truly achieving what uh, Congressman Lambert has uh, described. And uh, however that can be uh, facilitated, I know I would be interested in, I, I look forward to working with you on that. Uh, and then, General Gamble, the Army has been pursuing the Advanced Combat Engine, ACE, since 2015. At a substantial cost to taxpayers, while trying to fund over 30 critical modernization priorities. Meanwhile, there are fully developed combat vehicle proven engines able from industry that offer similar fuel efficiency at a potentially lower cost. Do you believe that the uh, ACE? ACE substantially exceeds the performance capabilities of existing engines, particularly with respect to fuel efficiency and reliability. Can you describe what metrics the Army is using to make these, this comparison and the status of the ACE in achieving them? And finally, can you commit to publicly releasing performance data and status as industry competitors would so that we can ensure that taxpayer dollars are being spent on the most capable, efficient, and reliable solution. Congressman, thanks very much for your question. I regret to inform you I'm unprepared to answer. It, if I may take it for the record, I assure you we'll, we'll have a thorough answer, uh, including your last point, sir. Over. Hey, thank you very much, and look forward to receiving your response. Yes, sir. Uh, the next question uh, for General Barrett. As a part of the Joint Task Force, the operational energy requirements of the land component will directly affect the size in, of air and maritime logistics requirements, which in turn need security forces and further increase operational energy demands. Can you share on how the Joint Staff analyzes future operational energy needs and how this uh, analysis drives recommendations for force array across combatant commands? Congressman, thanks for the question, and, and yes, I can share some thoughts on that. Uh, first, I would say uh, I'd like to make the point that we don't, we don't fight as services, we fight as a joint force. And so all of us here are committed to understanding uh, what are the joint requirements uh, to win our nation's wars and to, uh, and to contribute to integrated deterrence uh, going forward. With that specific question on operational energy, uh, what I'd like to pose to you is that uh, we, we certainly rely on our combatant commanders, in particular their theater posture plans, uh, as we look to the future uh, with, with exercises of the joint force and what the energy requirement is. We rely on them and their thought posture plans to forecast for the future. And then a very important organization that I know you know well is the Defense Logistics Agency. And so the Defense Logistics Agency has an important uh, responsibility to take those theater posture plans and develop global petroleum distribution plans that help uh, us define what those requirements would be not only today 
but as we look to the future. That next plan uh, we're anticipating out in the spring of 2022, which will help us uh, look forward to the next year. But I would go further in to tell you that uh, as we look to changing operational constructs in the future, uh, you, you're familiar with the joint warfighting construct and where we perhaps go with that. It's important for us to continue to use exercises and analysis so that we can stay ahead of what DLA develops as a global demand. Because where the warfighter changes their scheme of maneuver, logistics must follow. And so we are committed uh, to continue to look at service support constructs and where that meets joint requirements. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much. I want to thank each of you for your service as a uh, very grateful uh, Army dad, three sons serving in the Army, and Navy dad, one in the Navy, and uh, also grateful uh, uh, son-in-law of a Marine who served with Distinction World War II, and uh, my dad served uh, with the Army Air Corps uh, Flying Tigers uh, in India and China. So thank you all for your service. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wilson. What about the, fa the uh, Space Force? What, what member of your family is in the Space Force? Well, hey, 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 I, I was with the Commander General Redmond uh, last week at the uh, Clemson victory uh, over Yukon. So, hey, uh, but that's my association with Space Force. So, and, but I want to give credit, actually, to uh, Congressman Mike Rogers for his persistence and President Trump's uh, vision to have a Space Force. Thank you. Very good segue. Um, uh, moving on here. Um, Ms. McLean, you're up. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, I want to applaud all of you on the monumental task of um, the refugee airlift out of Afghanistan. The logistical challenge that you all faced um, and, and actually conquered was nothing short of uh, miraculous. So thank you for your efforts on that. I want to discuss the Army's plans to transition both the tactical and the non-tactical wheeled vehicles, um, the wheeled vehicle fleet to hybrid of all electric vehicles. While I completely agree with the department's conclusion that the logistics of providing fuel to our vehicles in areas of operation is daunting, clearly, I'm concerned that the technology to provide the power whether it be that battery or recharging capabilities, may be too far in the future to consider a major transition in our vehicle fleet uh, on the short term. Lieutenant General Gamble, what is the Army's approach and, and really timeline for that transition? Congresswoman, thanks for your question. Uh, I, I do agree with your assertion that uh, maybe some of the technologies are uh, out of reach in the near term, and our electrification strategy reflects that. Uh, the uh, tactical and combat vehicle electrification initial capabilities document was developed. There was a pathway to aim for full electrification uh, first into our light and medium tactical vehicles by 2035 and the heavy tactical wheel vehicle fleet uh, after 2036. And some of that the, that's full electrification. The timelines that are in our strategy or in our initial capabilities document uh, reflect what you said, that, that full electrification at the forward edge of the battlefield uh, may not be technologically achievable given uh, the requirements for combat operations at this point. But left of that, uh, we're look, as I stated, tried to articulate earlier, uh, left of that, uh, in, infusion of uh, start-stop technology, anti-idle technology, which is mature, and hybridization, which we think is near maturity, um, it, both in combat vehicles and our light tactical wheel, wheel, wheeled vehicles. Uh, we think that is achievable between, 20, uh, between now and 2030. And then, uh, ma'am, you hit on something that we also, uh, I think, uh, well, I know the Army, the Army sees it the same way. Uh, our, the electrification of our non-tactical vehicles and our garrisons and our installations provides us opportunities to, re, to look at ways we can uh, inform the force and, and to innovate, quite frankly, as high, highlighted by other members of this distinguished committee. The innovation coming from, uh, 
from in the innovation that comes from our, our national industrial base, not our organic uh, industrial base, but our broader national industrial base, which includes our commercial partners. So using non-tactical wheeled vehicles uh, and understanding the use of them, understanding that technology, building trust in our, our soldiers, our civilians, and our leaders in our non-tactical wheel, wheeled vehicle fleet and the infrastructure that goes along with that non-tactical wheeled vehicle fleet and garrisons will help us uh, transition and fully understand uh, not only the technology but the challenges associated with incorporating it uh, into our combat vehicles. And so in a nutshell, we do have a three-phased approach that reflects uh, your assertion uh, that some of the technology is, is slightly out of reach at this point in time. Uh, so we're starting with anti-idle, moving to hybrid electric uh, with an aim to in full, full electric. I I appreciate that. I have one more question. Um, and just in the interest of time, I don't mean to cut you off, but how does the Army plan on providing the electricity to the to vehicles in the combat zones? I'm, I think that's what I'm trying to grasp. My, I mean, we're going into a combat zone and we're trying to provide electricity. How, how do you see that happening? So, ma'am, you've described a, a daunting challenge. Um, we don't, we don't, I don't mean to be glib, uh, so please forgive me, but we don't envision mobile charging stations uh, like our, you know, our, our Army installations have. But <clears throat> hybrid electric is within our reach. Uh, other fuel technologies, as highlighted by some of the other distinguished members of the, of the committee, uh, hydrogen you know, fuel cells may provide us an opportunity to electrify vehicles on the move. Uh, but the first, we're, we're thinking big and starting small. Uh, we do think, though, that our first purpose-built all-electric vehicle uh, we'll prototype in FY22 an electric light reconnaissance vehicle. So while it's very small, uh, it is, it is, there is room, we believe, in current technology for very small, full electrification today. Uh, and we are working through those challenges, as you described. Thank you, sir. We have to start somewhere, right? Yes, ma'am. Think big, start small. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Ms. McLean. Uh, a good series of questions uh, and, and good answers directed at the Army. I'm going to take uh, to each one of you the services to answer the same question. Start small, what's your next step, uh, and what is your vision beyond that next step? Uh, let's start with the, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to start with the, uh, the Navy and the Marine Corps. And I specifically want to bring to light your Navy contested logistics war room uh, as a way of answering the uh, issues that Ms. McLean brought forward. So uh, I'll leave it to uh, the Admiral and the General to fight out who goes first. Looks like the Admiral. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, for the opportunity uh, to talk about my war room. Uh, basically, this effort started about uh, two and a half years ago. And as I mentioned, our five vector model, looking at re refuel, rearm, uh, revive, and resupply our fleet. Uh, we talk a lot about operational energy. The one thing I think we have learned is it's all commodity, right? We have to understand what the fleet needs to be lethal. The intent of our war room is um, to do data analysis, to be able to see as uh, General Barrett talked, uh, ourselves is incredibly value, valuable to us, particularly in this space. Uh, we put a lot of effort into uh, a digital transformation, looking at modernizing our log IT systems, being able to uh, smart start small. Is it capable of seeing what a ship, a squadron is actually consuming at the tactical end? Uh, in our world, in my world, the idea of endurance is not a new one. We understand fuel, we understand uh, food. You have to have those two things. But I, we are finding through our learning that that's also very applicable to weapon systems. It's very applicable to every commodity that a ship um, consumes. Uh, we look at that, uh, not through just the law continuum of inter intra last tactical mile, but we work very closely with DAS and sustainment at, in this learning as we are gaining this information. 
we are feeding it back to our industrial base uh, to ensure that they understand uh, what endurance means to us. Are the parts that we are procuring lasting as long as they should be? Are there um, single points of failure within our supply chain? Another part of the analysis that we're parting, uh, we partner with DAS and sustainment. And then the other part that comes out of the uh, log war room through this analysis is marrying the supply chain with the distribution network and understanding that all the way from CONUS to the last tactical mile, to the sailor or the Marine out there on an island or in the high north or wherever those individuals are, uh, and being able to do the analysis to inform our acquisition process, the platforms in which we purchase. Uh, can, we ha can we come up with innovative solutions on how to solve those issues? We work very closely with the other services. Uh, we work very closely with the joint staff. Uh, we solidify that through our wargaming process. Uh, the CNO um, and the SECNAV, uh, obviously, they understand the significance of uh, logistics. It is now part of our narrative in our uh, NAV plan uh, signed up by the CNO and uh, his uh, uh, guidance to me. So much so that he has directed us to run a series of three war games. Uh, we have completed our first, which baselined us. Our next one, uh, based on our learning, is to take uh, the fuel, the commodities, all the, all, the, all the things necessary to make our fleet lethal and play that game, validate our assumptions, and then go into the acquisition process as we uh, start generating uh, those assets. And then the other part of it that uh, uh, General Barrett mentioned is uh, also the allies and partners and having ro uh, robust conversations with them. And what are their uh, supply chain capabilities and what uh, is their logistic system and how do we fit into theirs and how they fit into ours? And I'd offer General Ban to his comments. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for the opportunity to comment, uh, and Admiral Williamson for the, those lead-in comments. So um, the Marine Corps, first off, has been very uh, fortunate to benefit and work hand-in-glove with the Navy through their war room. Uh, we have liaison officers on the Navy staff and our Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, as well as our folks down in our Expeditionary Energy Office are, are closely tied in with those efforts. Um, so I agree with everything that has been said thus far, particularly if we're talking about electrification and, um, you know, of, of future vehicle fleets, especially in a tactical environment, that would be very much of a long-term goal. I think hybrid electric is much more of a near-term goal. Uh, and before that, it's how do we reduce the demand on fuel through being more efficient with our existing platforms. And we've made some successes there with software upgrades to our MTVR fleet, our medium tactical vehicle vehicle fleet uh, that uh, re yield 10 to 15 percent efficiency in, in current fuel sources. Um, and as we think about future uh, vehicles, we will clearly be very interested in, in being able to look at hybrid electric technology as it becomes more available. I think this also underscores um, the importance of uh, improving our distribution, which we talk about in our uh, Marine Corps 2030 strategic logistics plan and strategy. Uh, critical to that as we think in terms of sustaining our stand-in forces in a distributed environment are those the ability to get fuel where it needs to be. So as we, as we work with the Navy and uh, with the Joint Force on littoral connectors, uh, particularly the, the light amphibious warship, which I mentioned earlier, and the opportunity potentially through leased or contract vessels that we would be able to experiment on improving the distribution of fuel into our, uh, our end point of use. Uh, obviously with the goal of reducing consumption in the long term, but uh, in the near term, we will still probably have a degree of reliance there. Um, and we're happy to talk with the committee members more uh, on, a, on an in-depth level of our efforts with respect to demand reduction, should there be an interest to do so. So thank you for the opportunity to comment, Mr. Chairman. So, so, Mr. Chairman, I would, I would just echo, I think, I think our strategy is uh, along the lines of what the Army is, right? Think big and start small. Uh, I mentioned some of those already. Um, you know, we, we, we do exercises in war games that help inform operational concepts that'll work. Um, that leads to some uh, capability gap analysis and, and identification. We then do experimentation um, and, and do some pilots, uh, perhaps launch some R&D programs. So that's where we get into some of the expeditionary energy 
um, solutions that we're testing out now, like photovoltaic cells and battery and hybrid, um, much, much like what General Gamble said. Um, we also do operational energy uh, enhancements on, you know, weapon systems, micro veins on C-17s that are, that are looking very uh, promising in terms of uh, allowing those aircraft to fly much more fuel efficiently and having a great return on investment uh, for what we would have to do to put the modification on the aircraft versus the fuel savings that we would get once that modification is in place. Um, but what I might offer to you, uh, Mr. Chairman, is um, the question you, you posed at the very beginning, right? Uh, where do we need Congress's help? Uh, I think all of us are, are in the realm of doing the, the wargaming, the exercising, uh, experimentation. Uh, the challenge I think that we will have moving forward is once we find things that work, how do we scale it, right? That's the challenge. How do you scale it? Um, and that has long been what I would, you know, what we in the Air Force sometimes call the valley of death, where, where the R&D project uh, launches, you have success, uh, you think it's a viable uh, way forward, but then scaling it becomes very challenging. Um, you know, certainly in the Air Force, uh, you know, our nation asks us to do more than the resources that the Air Force has to do it. And so it's a very keen competition with all the things that we need to bring to bear from, from an Air Force to support the joint fight uh, to get these things in the program. The onus is on us as the logisticians, the professional logisticians, to make that case in our service, uh, to get it into our budget. But when they are in the budget, I think Congress's help here is, is to help us um, uh, keep those in the budget so that we can scale some of these ideas at, at, uh, at a rapid pace. Um, General Gamble, do you want to add? You started the conversation. It's moved on. Do you want to add about your own war gaming and uh, how that's fitting into this? Yes, sir. Uh, so I mentioned earlier our uh, operational energy strategy that's under development. Uh, it's I think it's important to, for me to to state that it's under development by Army Futures Command, uh, and that's where all our experimentation and war gaming that informs our modernization program occurs. So. Uh, it is inextricably linked. The modernization efforts, the, 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 the tactical wheel vehicle, electrification strategy is all fully nested with the Army modernization programs. Um, and so the uh, Project uh, Convergence 21, I was just there uh, this last month at uh, White Sands Missile Range where operational energy was front and center in our Army modernization efforts. So on display were microgrids, leader follower technology on some of our cargo vehicles that while it doesn't uh, reduce energy consumption, it reduces the overall number of vehicles required to deliver the same goods. So while it's not platform centric, it's formation centric with uh, more distribution with less vehicles, which overall is a, is a reduction of demand. Uh, so that's what I, that's the only thing I'd like to close, uh, at least this last question with is that in the Army, we're inextricably linked. Our modernization programs, the visions associated with that, all the experimentation uh, that feeds that, uh, operational, uh, operational energy is inherently a part of that. I'm going to come back uh, after our, Mr. Clay, you're next, if you'd like to follow up questions. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd, I'd like to go back to to Red Hill and, and you know, Vice Admiral um, Williamson, I know that you don't have all the answers concerning Red Hill and, and the SECNAV and Admiral Knott and others in Hawaii are, and Commander of PAC Fleet is, is directly addressing this situation. But maybe you can talk to um, the uh, bulk fuel storage in the Pacific. You know, we talked about the subterranean tanks at Red Hill and right now, there's about 110 million gallons there. It has the capability, if all 20 tanks were filled at 12.5 million gallons each, you could have about 250 million gallons of fuel in Hawaii. We know that there's smaller, but bulk fuel storage uh, facilities in the Pacific. But what does the, has the Navy looked at or the Pentagon looked at um, how much fuel we would need in the Pacific to execute the Pacific Deterrence Initiative or to posture our forces in the Pacific, because that's something that I think the people of Hawaii don't uh, understand or would like answers to. And maybe that's something that uh, is in your wheelhouse to address. Yes, sir. Um, as I mentioned- If I might just interrupt yes. a moment. Uh, please take this in a general point and we'll come back in a classified hearing. We're getting into some serious stuff here. Admiral, if you'll uh, 
in a general way answer the question. Yes, sir, uh, and thank you. Um, sir, um, in very general terms, obviously uh, the Navy is responsible for the joint force fuel requirements to the high water mark. Uh, the analysis that I spoke about earlier through our games and our learning, uh, understanding the impacts of operational, in, uh, of, uh, operational energy, Having the data and being able to see ourselves allows us to do better nodal analysis. And from a theater posture perspective, we're best to position those stores. Um, so I'll absolutely come back with you. We get classified very quickly uh, talking about this, but I'd be more than happy to get on your calendar and come back and give you a much uh, uh, more detailed answer than that. Um, when we're referring to the subject of energy on this committee, you know, you know, there are other military bases throughout the nation that have bulk fuel storage, whether they're above ground or subterranean, that have had leaks and issues. The Pacific Northwest is one example, and we have uh, addressed that issue um, in, in that particular case. Um, you know, has the Navy looked at, or will the Navy look at, um, if you? needed a certain amount of fuel in the Pacific, uh, in Hawaii, uh, you, you know what we have now in terms of the underground tanks. How could we do something differently that would preserve the fuel that we need for our national defense and readiness, but also protect the environment, protect the community uh, and the aquifer um, that right now doesn't seem to be happening? Yes, sir. Um Obviously, the safe, like I said before, the safety of the community, the people uh, where that uh, is paramount to us. Um, without getting into the classified level, sir, uh, I would love to be able to come back to you and talk and discuss that with you. Uh, we, we do look at that uh, on a, a very regular basis, and uh, I'd be more than happy to come back and provide you with that detail. Two things that the delegation uh, conveyed to the SECNAV is that you know, there is considerable resources spent at Red Hill, but often it's because the delegation at, is, is bringing those resources through the budget. We would really like to see in the next budget, the Navy, the Pentagon prioritize Red Hill, whether it's secondary containment, moving the facility, addressing the issue in its budget when it submits it to the Congress. That shows how serious the Navy is in taking uh, this issue seriously. And, and, and just on a final note, you talk about uh, how the Navy is, is uh, serious about dr addressing this. In just recent community meetings over the last few days when families and military families have spoken about their concerns, about what they've had to endure and deal with in terms of uh, their health and sickness, responses by senior Navy leaders in Hawaii have, have really brushed off their concerns and said, that they're continuing to drink the water and that uh, they don't feel um, that there may be an issue. They're still continuing to use or, or shower with the water. And, and that just doesn't convey a sense of, of seriousness in the situation. And I would highly suggest that our senior Navy leaders uh, in Hawaii and military representatives show that empathy and compassion um, to the people of our Hawaii and the military residents in Hawaii when these concerns are being brought to them. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, th uh, thank you, Mr. Kalehi. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, I know you're going to be leaving in a moment, and we're going to be terminating the committee in just a few moments also. Uh, a couple of things. The, there are technologies available that are able to, cl to cleanse water and it may very well be that there's, there's evidence of an ongoing contamination, uh, either uh, small, consistent, or episodic, but contamination. It may very well be in the next budget or the next NDAA, we may want to put in place for the water systems themselves um, a technique to cleanse the water. They do exist. Uh, the other uh, piece of this is, and it, as we've gone through this hearing, I keep coming back to the recent work of Congress, two-thirds of which is done. The remaining, well, half is done. Uh, the remaining issues are the NDAA, pertinent to what we're 
talking about here today, uh, and the Build Back Better legislation together with the infrastructure legislation. Uh, those two pieces of legislation have a very, very significant amount of money to deal with uh, water systems and uh, contaminated. On the NDAA side of it, there is language in the current version, at least the House version of the NDAA, dealing with the cleanup of past contamination. And that's an ongoing issue. And so we'll circle back, not only in the conference committee, on those issues. Uh, the passage of the infrastructure bill does have money for communities to put in advanced water systems. And so all of these things may come together. Um, also, uh, a couple of thoughts from the chairman here is that the, um, the military is moving out on these issues of reducing dependency on petroleum products. Uh, none of you, although in your written testimony did, but none of your oral testimony spoke to what you're actually doing, electrification of aircraft. Small, albeit, but nonetheless, it's happening. Uh, also, in your uh, written testimony, you spoke to, uh, all of you spoke to um, using uh, your research to improve the efficiency of the systems that currently consume petroleum products. And I want to compliment you on that. It has been noticed. Uh, also, um, in the current NDAA, in the House version of the NDAA and in setting up in past versions of the NDAA is moving to the non-tactical tactical vehicle fleet. Running around on all of your bases are a whole bunch of internal combustion engine vehicles. Uh, the, it is the intent of at least this chairman of this committee, if I can persuade others to go along, is that the second largest fleet of electric vehicles will be the U.S. military fleet of the non-tactical vehicles that are operating on all of your bases. Uh, you will be second behind the post office. So uh, the other piece of this is that you don't need to invent this. It's happening. Also in the um, infrastructure bill is a vast amount of money for the electrification grid. I draw your attention to that. I see all of you nodding, you're familiar with it. Uh, there will be new techniques, new technologies, and new ways of providing a um, grid that can sustain a charging system. All of that is happening. Uh, the adoption of that by the military, uh, perhaps in lead or in following, either way, it will be part of your future life. Um, so our goal here today was to find ways and to illuminate the need to reduce the consumption of, of uh, petroleum-based energy for the purposes of climate change, for the purposes of cost, uh, and to uh, where and when possible to have a more effective military, whether that's the uh, ability to conduct operations or to be able to reduce the cost of uh, your cost factors so that you can spend money on other things that are high priority. So we're going to drive that issue. There will be a series of questions that we will uh, deliver to all of you in the days ahead, more spe uh, specificity following up on this. Uh, also, and this goes to uh, General Barrett, you've got a very, very important task here. Uh, we don't have Space Force here yet. <clears throat> But we'll figure out, we do know that rockets consume a vast amount of energy and develop a very significant addition to the climate issue. Leaving that aside for a moment, General Barrett, it is, I would hope, and I, I, we've already talked about this, you know it is your responsibility to make sure all of us are working together, that the stovepipe doesn't exist and that you work across all of the uh, joint force. And so we'll be coming back to you on that. We want to go into this in um, a classified setting to answer many of the questions that uh, 
Mr. Kalehi has raised and others have raised, uh, and we will do so. We did not cover today, and I want to compliment myself for not bringing up the logistics issue. Uh, I have been uh, warned and double warned that I could get off on a tangent. Control yourself, Chairman. Um, I do want to come back to the logistics. We will do a specific hearing uh, in the coming year, uh, early in the coming year on logistics so that we can inform ourselves on what is needed in the next NDAA. Uh, so uh, be prepared for that. Uh, I know that all of you are working on that issue uh, and it involves um, techniques, technology, and um, new equipment along the way. And we want to get into that in depth so that we fully inform the next NDAA that you have what you need to address not only in the question of how you're going to reduce your consumption of fuel, but also how you will deliver that reduced amount of fuel. With that, Mr. Lamborn, anything to add? Gentlemen, thank you. Thank your staff. Uh, and by the way, a comment. The alliteration that went into the Navy's um, document was noted. The five R's and the five C's. Thank you very, very much.